Hey, hey, party people. I recently bought myself one of these Schmincke watercolor tins. I ordered mine on dickblick.com because I got a gift certificate from my best friend for my birthday last month, but I know that they sell this exact one elsewhere. I'll drop a link in the description box, whatever. FYI, these little pans for the actual paints themselves are sold separately. So you get this tin with these frames in here and uh, this is what it looks like closed up. There's a thumb loop on the bottom. So I guess you can hold on to it better when everything is all opened up. But you order these separately. You can get the full pan size or you can get these half pan sizes. And so I got the half pan sizes. And then you just snap them in here. Ta-da! And I'm assuming this empty space in here is for brushes. I have a lot of brushes that can fit in here. Sadly, not my new favorite Escoda brush, but you know, this new silver brush I got fits in there. That's a round 10. And this is my Series 7 Winsor & Newton size 3. I could fit both in there and still close everything up just fine, so that's cool. They have this in two different sizes that I saw. They have one for that's big enough for 12 of these little half pans, and they have a bigger one that has space for 48 of these little half pans. Most of the videos that talk about these traveling watercolor kits, they don't really talk about why they pick the colors that they do. So that's what this video is going to focus on. Those of you who are familiar with my channel know that the vast majority of what I paint are people wearing clothes. And so that kind of informs the, my paint color decision making process. And I'm not going to be painting rocks and trees and landscapes or architecture very much. People wearing clothes, which means I'm going to want some good skin tone colors, some good hair colors, and then I'm going to want a variety of colors for a variety of different clothes. If you watched my how to start a sketchbook video from a couple of weeks ago, then you know that one of the things that I suggested for smashing the first page was to do swatches. I did these swatches and they're larger than most swatches are because I also wanted to do a granulation test. Granulation is when the color, when the paint kind of separates and creates a texture when it hits water and paper. This is a Winsor Newton Cadmium Red Wash. This is the Winsor Newton Spectrum Red Wash. And you see how there's no texture here? Okay, it's just smooth. And then this, you can really see the texture of the paper reacting with the paint, that's granulation. Let's start with some easy choices. Those of you who are familiar with the way I approach color mixing, I use a CMYK system to start the color mixing process, okay? I use the kind of red, yellow, blue as primary colors for design work and creating color schemes, but I use cyan, magenta, yellow, and black in terms of how to mix colors. Okay. So uh, let's pick a yellow, magenta, and a cyan to start. So I have six yellows. Do I need even two of these in my kit? No, I do not. And I think that the most uh, straightforward yellow is this Winsor Newton Primary Yellow. This one's a touch warmer. These are pretty warm. These are very cool. This one, I think, is the most even yellow. The closest out of all the colors that I have to cyan is my Winsor Newton Thalo Blue. My Talons Magenta Permanent Rose is the closest to straightforward magenta, so that's what I'm going to grab. And I have three blacks. This is a watercolor, and I already made the decision to stick to all gouaches for this set. Uh, this one is a little bit softer and a little bit cooler, but this one granulates, and do I want that? Mm, I don't know. Overall, I like this black better, so I think that's the one I'm going to go with. So that is the Winsor Newton Ivory Black. 
And then we're going to need a white. And I have a bunch of whites because I like testing white gouaches. You know, opacity of the white is a good quality indicator for the gouache line in general. I like the Pabeo permanent white. And I like the Windsor & Newton permanent white. I'm going to go with the Pabeo because I've used it less. And so I want to have more playtime with it. The next order of business is skin tones. These are all my burnt sienna, burnt umber, yellow ochre, you know. I love yellow ochre because I tend to add yellow ochre to this more orangey burnt sienna to kind of tone down the orange. And then, but these burnt, look at these three burnt siennas and look at how different they are. And this is why we swatch, okay. I really like this color. Number one, it doesn't granulate, and I definitely don't want granulating skin colors. That kind of makes a weird texture on the skin that I don't want. So this one doesn't granulate, and it is an already beautiful, soft, look at how closely it resembles my own skin tone, okay? And then the darker you get, you can get some really nice medium to dark skin tones. And then if I want really dark, I tend to just start with the straight burnt umber anyway. So I think I'm going to pick this one, the Pabeo burnt umber, burnt sienna, excuse me. I want this Mamery burnt umber for the super dark because I feel like I can get this color by mixing these two colors. This one's a little bit warmer. When I do Asian skin tones, I do like to add a tiny bit of this Naples yellow. And then I'm gonna add these. This one is way orangier than this. This one is much yellower, but these work really well to mix a lot of neutral tones. And I think that's gonna really round out kind of my warm neutral section. And which one do I want? Okay, I'm gonna go with this one. I've been meaning to pick up a raw umber and play with it. It's the warm neutral that's missing in my collection. So I'm gonna save an empty slot for a raw sienna to pick up in the future. And a raw sienna, it's a cool mustardy brown. Not anywhere near as warm as these, not as green as these. Now I'm cheating with myself because I know I said that I wasn't going to use any watercolors. I was going to do only gouaches. But so long story short, I keep hearing watercolors talk about Payne's Gray, how it's this amazing color. Everyone's talking about it. So the last time I went shopping for watercolor, I picked up this Windsor Newton watercolor in Payne's Gray. And when I swatched it, I was like, wow, that's actually really pretty. <laughs> Anything else on this page I want, okay, I do want an alizarin crimson, but I want a gouache. So I'm going to leave an empty slot for alizarin crimson, a gouache to buy in the future as I'm traveling because it's a traveling watercolor kit. Mm. I am really compelled to add this rose tyrian. Many of you know that I die for this color. Oh my God, it's so pretty. I'm going to grab that just because it makes me happy. All right, we just all need things that make us happy. So I think we're done with this double truck. So we're here. It's a toss up between this Prussian blue and this indigo blue, which one I love more. I'm not going to pick any of the turquoise. I don't like either of these turquoises. It's very easy to make with the thalo blue. And I'm gonna pick one of these ultramarines so that I have a really cool granulating blue for some cool effects. I'm gonna go with the Knicker brand because it's, a, it's just like a touch more intense. I like that. I'm going to pull this Linden Green because it just makes me happy. This is like Rose Tyrion. It's just this, the tube, the color, just everything about it just makes me happy. So I want it. This Viridian Lake is really nice, but what I really want in my kit is a solid green and I don't have that. So I'm gonna try to mix one. Dun, 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 Okay, I'm just gonna put this here so I know how much I'm gonna need potentially. This is just a Blick palette knife. I mostly use it to separate watercolors, uh, watercolor pages from the block. Okay. And a little scrap piece of paper. 
You may be wondering, well, Zoe, why don't you just put the Viridian Lake and the Linden Green in your kit and mix it? The point of the kit, the point of having 24 colors is so that you have shortcuts, okay? If I didn't want shortcuts in my watercolor tin, then I would have just picked the CMYK, the white, and like a couple of browns and that's it. But the whole point of this is to create a kit with all the shortcuts you want, right? And I know that I'm gonna want a solid green more often than I'm going to want this, you know, greenish, bluish, you know, color instead. So if I want the greenish, bluish, then I'll go ahead and mix some cyan back into it. Yes. That is the green I want. It looks like a true rich green. I have a true green. I'm gonna take this linden green. I'm going to be able to make greens like this. I'm going to let that dry and then I'll clean up the rest when it's a little less gloopy. Probably need a purple. If you notice, I don't have any purple. Let's make one. Let's make a purple. Let's make it out of cyan and magenta. So we have our thalo blue. You know the rule, guys, don't use your teeth. Oh my God. This is like all dried out. All right, this tube is dead, and I guess a replacement is on the shopping list. All right, so there's that, which is fine because it's gonna dry and you're gonna re-wet it and everything anyway, so the fact that it's kind of extra dry now is not a big deal that aside and then we'll scoop up the rest to create a purple any one of those like things where you have you can empty your toothpaste with it All right, there's the purple. I put a shopping list and a do not buy list on the back, okay? And then the last bit is my oranges and reds. I have granulating and non-granulating. I have cool, I have warm. I'm going to go with this Winsor Newton cadmium red. It's a warm granulating red. Okay, I have all these warm, non-granulating reds. And then the Winsor Newton Spectrum Red, which is like a hair cooler than true red, right? It's a little bit cooler. Or it might just look really cool next to all these warmer reds, but this one is non-granulating. So I can make all these warmer, non-granulating oranges and whatnot with the yellow. Do I need an orange? I don't know, do I have space in my kit? I wanted an alizarin crimson. I wanted a raw umber. I'm gonna add this Windsor Newton cadmium orange. I have room for two more. So I've decided that I'm going to take this Carmen Lake, the Knicker Carmen Lake. I worry about a little bit of the granulation and the talons, and this is a brand that I haven't worked with much at all. So I'm going to take this as my backup. This is a brand I already love and use a ton of. And then I'm gonna leave one blank, because I know me. I'm gonna shop, I'm gonna fall in love with something, I'm gonna wanna start using it. Okay, so this is how I'm gonna order them, top row, purples to pinks to reds to orange to yellows to greens. This is going to be my alizarin crimson, alizarin crimson. This is going to be my my mystery future magical paint. White, light neutral, dark neutrals, and then blues on the bottom row. All right, let's fill up this sucker. 
The reason why I've been using a tube, watercolors, and gouaches all this time as opposed to using pans is the ability to mix large amounts of a custom color uh, whenever I need to because so much of what I do design-wise is to make a bunch of illustrations with the same fabric board. And so, you know, if I've selected a purple, a specific purple for my fabric board, then I'm gonna use that, I want that same purple for all the illustrations I'm gonna do for the project, the practice ones and the final ones, right? With marker, you just kind of pick one that's as close as you can get, but with paint, you wanna get exact. And so, once I finalized my fabric board, I would mix up a big batch of that purple, that exact purple that I want, and then use it for the duration of the project without having to keep mixing it over and over and over again. And that is, I mean, that's not something you can do with pans. I'm sure you could, wherever there's a will, there's a way, but with tubes, it's, you know, 500 times easier. So that's why I've been using tubes, but that is not exactly super portable. So, you know, for traveling up until now, I've done a lot of, um, I've used a lot of brush pens, watercolor pencils, that sort of thing, which is awesome, but now I want to try this thing. I'm going to be in Maui in March. I'm going to England and Poland in April. I'm probably going to be in LA in May. I'm going to be in New York, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. in June, Vancouver in July. I think that's all the travel I have planned so far, and that's a combination of work and personal. I'm really excited. I can't wait to start using this. When this is all dry and everything, I'm going to take a clean Q-tip and kind of clean stuff up. It's going to be easier to clean these once the paint inside is dry. All right, so there is my kit. I cannot wait to start using this. Please do give this video a thumbs up if you found it useful or entertaining, if you learned a thing or two. Uh, do share your tips and tricks on watercolor tins, what you like, what you don't like, what you're having problems with, and what neat trick or tip that you learned while painting while traveling that you'd like to share with the rest of us. And uh, I will see you in the next video.